Hey guys, Derek Best, Beacon Fight for Life. As you most likely have heard, or if you haven't heard, what we're about at the Beacon Fight for Life is reconnecting the Australian multicultural community. Our main goal is to reduce the number of Australians taking their own life in Australia. Currently, suicide is the leading cause of death of all Australians 15 to 44 for men. Uh, Indigenous people are three times likely to take their own life, and, and it's sad to say that 65,000 people a year in Australia attempt suicide. So the Beacon Fight for Life, we want to reduce the number of people taking their own life, and so what we're going to, we're going to play over the coming months is some footage of conversations I've had with individuals, groups, multicultural, you name it, I'll interview them, so that we can start to make inroads for people um, to stop them from taking their own life give them information and places to reach out to. So, stay tuned. Hey guys, Derek Best, Beacon Fight for Life. I've got the great pleasure of interviewing Imar Quigley again. Um, as you might have seen last year, uh, at the end, towards the end of the year, we had a, had a great interview and uh, a podcast. And what we discussed was some the basics of what a, what a person could expect uh, when they, they visit a psychologist, and we went through that. Um, for those who didn't see the interview, Imar is a clinical psychologist and has been for 20 years, or been a psychologist for 20 years. Uh, she's a lecturer at ECU College, ECU University, um, and also has a passion for helping people that are suffering to um, assist them to improve their well-being. Imar, thank you so much for allowing me to do this again. I really Pleasure. appreciate it. Just so you know, the last podcast that we did um, was, was sensational. It actually not only went across Australia. Um, looking at the stats, we, we we touched the USA, the UK. You had friends in Ireland, you know, yep. that you said that were sharing it amongst themselves. Malaysia and Vietnam. It's amazing. So that's awesome. And our our outcome is to make sure that we reach every household in Australia to start with. So to be global is fantastic. Yeah. So thank you. And another great thing that you, you've kindly done for, for us is you've created this um, suicide assessment and management manual. And you can get that on the homepage at thebeaconfightforlife.org, thebeaconfightforlife.org. If you go there to our website and you can download that. And for people that would be interested to, to make it, to not do an intervention, but to just assess, to see if their friend that they might think could have a, a psycho, um, um, uh, being going through a mental problem that they could download this and just have a look you know, it's not going to you know solve all the questions but it's just going to give uh, raise awareness and and so the things the signs that you can look for and it touches on things like the warning signs um risk factors and protective factors and also there's some statistics in there that you can have a look at about suicide and that was really what we talked about in the last interview as well so yes. we really wanted to have i guess more information for people if they wanted to read up get a bit more insight into suicide assessment exactly mm. so thank you um the other things that we touched on last time with the the conversation in the podcast were what professionals are looking for when they're addressing when they're assessing someone during a consultation mm. what are the tipping points um, what people would actually need to know to potentially save someone from suicide. And those can be seen if you go to our YouTube channel on bigandfightforlife.org as well on YouTube. And you can see the full interview there or you can see snippets of those conversations that we had with Imar. So today what we're going to do, Imar, is we're going to elaborate on that. I, had, I ask you some questions up front and you've kindly gone in and, and dissected them for me because we looked at it from a professional's mm. perspective last time. Mm. Now I want to look at it from a layman's term. For people that think, um, you know, is he or is she or are they or am I experiencing a mental episode? So we've gone, been a little bit creative as well today. What we've done is we've set the scene that would be normally in a psychologist's office. Um, so you can see it's quite comfortable. This room is quite spacious. Maybe they won't all be as spacious, but there's usually a, a couch. Yep. So you, usually, yep, the client would sit on a couch or a chair, and then there's usually a small table, and the therapist, psychologist would be sitting on another chair, and it's really just facing each other and having a conversation. Yep. And body language is really important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So I, there's definitely nothing to be worried about in this environment. It's no, there's no big bright lights, except for that one because we're filming, but there's no big bright lights that are going to coming down. It's not going to be intimidating. It's just going to be a general conversation. Yeah, and most people, once they get in here, start to feel more comfortable. Mm. Um, and this is one, one of our therapy rooms. Um, but before they come in here, they don't have an idea mm. on what it might look like. So mm. hopefully by having the interview here, people will feel a bit more comfortable if they're thinking of going to see a psychologist, but they don't know what it's going to be like and will I be lying on a couch or where will mm. they be sitting? This is generally what it looks like, what it feels like. Excellent. So thank you for letting us do that. So we'll get straight into it then, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah? great. So we're going to go through some really basic questions from that I've asked and you've gladly, uh, kindly answered for me. So what is mental health? So there's a lot of terms that people can get confused about and mental health is certainly one of them. A lot of people will use mental health to mean something that is wrong. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the World Health Organization defines mental health as functioning well in life and being able to cope with everyday stresses that happen to us all. Mm. And so Instead of using mental health, I try to use terms like mental well-being or mental wellness yep. because there can be quite a stigma attached to mental health. Yes. And what we also know about mental wellness is it's the same as our physical wellness. Everybody has it mm. and we all need to take care of it. And interestingly, some of the things that are really useful to keep up with our physical health also help a lot with our mental wellness. So things like getting a good night's sleep, eating well and exercising regularly can help a lot with our mental well-being as well as our physical well-being. And they're really basic things to, to do. Yeah. So what is a mental episode or a mental health episode? Yeah, so people will use the term a mental health episode when a person is experiencing um, a, a difference in their behaviour, their feelings, their thoughts over a specific period of time, so over that episode. Mm. It's most commonly used when somebody is having what professionals would call a depressive episode. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about depression a little bit later. Yes. So that's really where the person is um, struggling with their functioning for a discrete period of time. Yep. Anywhere from two weeks, it could be up to six months, it could be longer. Uh, the other um, time we might hear the word episode being used is psychotic episode. Mm -hmm. So basically um, a psychotic episode is when somebody is experiencing psychosis, mm -hmm. which is when they have difficulty differentiating between what is real and what is not real. Yeah. So they might see or hear people that other people don't see and hear hallucinations, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And what we know about um, psychotic illness and psychotic episodes is uh, normally once the person seeks treatment uh, with medication and other treatments, they can actually, um, th that episode can resolve. Yeah, okay. yeah. How common are mental health disorders? Yeah, so mental health disorders, um, just to, um, for the listeners to understand what me we mean by that. Mm. Mental health disorders is more of a professional term uh, where the person is experiencing something that meets certain criteria yes. uh, and significantly impacts on their life. So um, basically what we know in Australia is about one in five people in any 12 month period will experience a mental health disorder like depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar, anorexia, which we're gonna talk about today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we imagine five people that we know, it's likely that one out of those people may have experienced a mental health disorder in the last 12 months. Mm. If we think about a room full of 30 people, yep. six of those people may have experienced a mental health disorder in the previous 12 months. Or be experiencing. Or be experiencing currently, absolutely. Yeah. Would you say everyone who dies by suicide had a drug or alcohol problem? No, and I wonder if that's a misconception mm. um, in the media. So uh, there's a really complex uh, relationship between drugs and alcohol and mental health and suicide. Yeah. Some of the things that we do know uh, is uh, there's some data from the WA coroner mm -hmm. um, that shows us that in the three months before a person dies by suicide, 
about a third of men and about a quarter of women will have a significant drug or alcohol problem. But if we flip that, that means that two thirds of men and three quarters of women mm. have not had a documented mm. uh, issue with drugs and alcohol. Mm. So we need to be careful again, like we talked about in the last podcast, yeah. about jumping to conclusions. I think that's a really important part too, because they, those figures, you know, completely uh, are different to what I would have thought. Yeah, yeah. And then I guess the other interplay is sometimes when people are experiencing emotional distress, they're finding things really tough, they can turn to <coughs> drugs and alcohol to help them to feel better, so as, as a coping strategy. Yeah. But what we know that is if people are using drug and, drugs and alcohol instead of addressing their mental health issues, it's probably just going to make things worse in the long term. Who can get depression or, or anxiety? Pretty much anybody at any age mm -hmm. can experience depression and or anxiety. Uh, one of the risk factors is a family history mm -hmm. of having depression or anxiety. But again, we have to remember that a risk factor isn't a certainty. So just because mom or dad or brother or sister has had depression doesn't mean that a person will necessarily have depression. So it's, it's complicated. Yeah. Mm. What is the difference between depression and anxiety? So depression and anxiety are quite different uh, mental health disorders. And I'll talk through both, take a few minutes uh, to talk through both mm, with please, you. Please, please. Yeah. So when we think about depression, we're thinking about the changes in three areas. So we, we talk about these three areas mm -hmm. quite a lot when we're looking at mental health disorders. So with depression, we're looking at a significant change in how the person is feeling. And those feelings would be feelings of hopelessness, feelings of worthlessness, prolonged feelings of sadness. So not just, oh, I'm feeling a bit sad for maybe 20 minutes, half an hour. This is most of the day, every day for at least two weeks okay. to have a depressive episode. Yeah. Um, then we look at changes in how they're thinking. People who are experiencing depression will find it much harder to concentrate. They'll be more distracted. They'll find it harder to make decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and they may have increased thoughts of death, dying and suicide, thoughts of taking their own life. And then the final one is physical changes. So what we see is some people have an increase in appetite, some people have a decrease in appetite. So they're more hungry, less hungry, eating more, eating less, significant weight gain, significant weight loss. Mm -hmm. Then we look at sleeping. Sleeping's a big indicator that something's not right in a person's life if there's other things um, happening alongside that. So if a person is needing a lot more sleep than normal, or they're having problems falling asleep, they're um, almost, uh, they've almost got insomnia, so significant mm -hmm. problems with sleeping. Um, they would be, and their energy is really, really low. So with somebody who's experiencing depression, mm -hmm. they'll have really low energy, really low motivation, and will um, lose interest in things that they used to really enjoy. So really low energy, even if they've been sleeping a lot. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's really the depression. Then the different types of depression, which I won't go into detail on, mm. they just um, depend on how chronic the issue is, like how severe it is, how long it goes on for, and how often it's happened. So mm. that's more of a, a professional will um, take a history and, and talk to the person about, well, you've had this for this long, and that looks like you meet the criteria for this mm -hmm. uh, disorder. So that's depression. Did yeah. you have any questions about the depression part before I talk about anxiety no, disorders? No, the anxiety disorders are? Yeah, so basically all of the anxiety disorders involve um, extreme fear or anxiety about something. Uh, and that fear or anxiety is more than what we would normally expect. So mm -hmm. a really good example is in 2019, if somebody was going to the shops every day and they were wearing a mask and they were wiping down their trolley mm -hmm. and they were hand sanitizing 
and they weren't coming within 1.5 meters of anybody. You know, a couple of years ago, we would look at that and go, wow, what's going on? Yeah. Oh, they're really worried about germs and, and mm -hmm. catching something. Mm. You look at last year with COVID and continuing this year, we're all doing those things mm. because there's a global pandemic. Wow. And so it's not excessive to the circumstances, right? Yep. So we're always thinking like that when we talk about mental health disorders. Mm. Is it out of the norm? Yep. And also for the age. So all kids when they're young will be scared of monsters under the bed. But if you're 13 and you're scared of monsters under the bed, they're it, that's not, um, you know, normal developmentally. So th things like that. Think about mm. the age. Think about the, the, age, the, the yeah, situation. situation. Yeah. So then we've got um, a whole list of different anxiety disorders, yep. um, depending on what the person is most fearing or anxious about. So mm. I'll just go through them. I've written them down, so um, yep. I make sure that I, I mention them all. So the first one is called specific phobia. So that's your classic, like a needle phobia, fear of flying, fear of heights, where the person has excessive fear about an object or an experience, mm. and they avoid that object or experience uh, to stop feeling that excessive fear. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next one is social anxiety, where a person is... Um, really uh, afraid uh, and anxious about being judged and or humiliated in a social setting. Mm -hmm. So a good example is meeting unfamiliar people yes. where they would go into that situation with thoughts of they're going to um, think that I'm stupid or they're not going to like me or um, I won't know what to say and they'll all laugh at me. So there's those kind of things mm. that come into social anxiety and as a result the person can avoid social situations. So mm. the next one is panic disorder. So that's when somebody experiences um, unexpected panic attacks um, a lot of the time and they then avoid lots of different areas, like they've had a panic attack at the shops and then they stop going to the shops. Mm -hmm. They've had a panic attack on the train, so they stop taking the train. So it's things that changes in their behavior as a result of what's happening for them. Yep. So a panic attack um, basically is when we have uh, an intense surge of fear um, that lasts only a few minutes but really takes over our whole body and has a lot of physical symptoms that goes with it. Mm -hmm. Agoraphobia is when a person um, is basically afraid to go into public places, mm -hmm. like the shops, public transport, that kind of stuff, and they'll actively avoid those areas, uh, those places. Some people, to um, get around that, they'll only go to those places with somebody they trust. Mm. So they'll never go to uh, public places by themselves. That's um, agoraphobia. And then the last one I wanted to touch on was generalized anxiety disorder. That's where a person has um, excessive worry about a number of different things in their life and um, they can't control that worry. So they might keep thinking and worrying about their financial situation and their relationship and their job and their friendships, it mm. kind of um, leaks into all areas of their life yeah. and they can't control that worry. We all worry about things. I was gonna say, I'm sure that, I'm sure everyone's got a touch of all of these things yes. at some time. Exactly. So that would be quite normal. It's yeah. just when there's an extended period of time. It's the period of time. So with anxiety, we're really looking at probably more than six months. Mm -hmm. And it's also... Um, so depression's two weeks. Yes. Anxiety's six months. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also what we're thinking about with anxiety is and depression mm -hmm. is that it significantly impacts the person's functioning. Mm -hmm. So it starts to affect their lifestyle. Exactly. Yeah. So... They stop going out with friends. They stop going to places. Mm. Uh, they avoid things, even though they really want to, say, have um, make friends, but they avoid anything to do with being able to make friends because mm. they're experiencing social anxiety. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
are bipolar and anorexia mental health conditions? Yeah, so both um, bipolar and anorexia are mental health disorders or mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. So just briefly, um, bipolar is a mix of having depressive episodes, which we've just talked about, mm -hmm. and having what we call manic episodes. So bipolar used to be called manic depression, and then they, they've relabeled it bipolar disorder okay. to really indicate that it's two poles of episodes. Mm. So your manic episode, again, we've got the three areas of change. Mm -hmm. With the change in feelings, they're going to have um, elevated mood. So they're going to be really, really happy and elevated or irritable, like severely irritable. With the changes in thinking, we would see things like racing thoughts, easily distracted. Mm -hmm. Their mind is just going at a million miles an hour. Remember, this is episodic. It's an episode. This mm -hmm. isn't something that they experience all the time. Mm -hmm. That might be more like an ADHD um, okay. picture. Yep. But when it's just for a, a certain amount of time, anywhere from two weeks up to a few months, then we're looking at... Um, could be a manic episode and then the third thing is physical changes so so you yeah. saying are you saying that a manic episode could last for up to months it can oh, wow okay. yeah yeah and again depending on the severity and the person might have uh, there's different there's bipolar one and there's bipolar two there's different okay. levels of the disorder and yep. um, so that would be to do with how long it goes for how many episodes they've had, how severe they are. Mm -hmm. So a manic episode can last f for months. Yeah. Can it last just for hours? No. So that's a common misconception. If somebody just has an elevated mood for a few hours, that's within the normal range. It's like if we're in a bit of a flunk and we're a bit sad for a few hours. Mm. We wouldn't say that somebody's got depression and is experiencing a depressive episode. Um, with mania a manic episode mm. it needs to be for at least two weeks so we need to be seeing that elevation for more than two weeks would they be super focused on one thing or could be just life in general could be multiple things um so the the other part i was i was just going to touch on is the physical changes mm -hmm. so over at least two weeks mm -hmm. they're not needing a lot of sleep and yet they have an awful lot of energy. So you asked the question earlier, mm. with depression, even though they might be sleeping a lot more, would they still have low energy? Absolutely. So that's the depression side. Mm. Mm. Whereas with the mania, you're looking at people that can survive for a number of weeks on three to four hours of sleep a night, or very little, even less than that, and they're still functioning, their thoughts are still racing, them, they're producing, they can be producing a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It can actually in, in some industries be, um, like in, in the um, creative arts, it can actually be quite a useful. I was going to say useful. Almost. I didn't know if I could say the word useful. <laughs> yeah, but. yeah. Um, if it's managed because yeah. our bodies can't go on for very long without regular sleep. Mm. And so that's where the irritability can come in, where they're going a million miles an hour, but everybody else is just really slow. Mm. And so they can get quite irritable rather than the elevated mood. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, so... Um, anorexia. Want, yeah. So anorexia is uh, one of the eating disorders, and the other main eating disorder is, disorder is called uh, bulimia nervosa. So anorexia mm. nervosa, bulimia nervosa. So anorexia is when a person deliberately decreases their food intake, mm -hmm. um, leading to significant low body weight. It has to be very significant. They use the medical and um, physical uh, BDI of less than 18. So mm -hmm. you need to be quite mm -hmm. low weight. And alongside that, they have an intense fear of gaining weight. They see themselves, their body and their weight differently to how other people see them. Mm -hmm. So they will be with a body mass index of less than 18 and they will look in a mirror and they will see themselves as overweight um, and, and larger than they actually are. Would I be wrong to say that anorexia is mainly a a female condition? It, it There are um, higher rates of anorexia in females. Mm -hmm. However, 
probably over the last 10 to 20 years, we've started to see an increase in males. Okay. Uh, females absolutely outnumber males when it comes to anorexia, mm. but increasingly we're starting to see, particularly in some um, industries, uh, where there is more of a focus on low body weight, mm -hmm. we are starting to see increases in uh, male cases of anorexia. Okay. Do you think medications should be prescribed to everyone struggling or are there alternative methods and what would they be if there are? So that's a really good question. Um, as a psychologist, I don't prescribe medication. So a lot of people um, will get confused between psychologists and psychiatrists. Mm. So psychologists do what we're doing now, doing kind of talking therapies, yeah. whereas psychiatrists uh, are medical doctors who prescribe medication for mm. mental health disorders. Mm. And GPs can also prescribe medication for mental health disorders. Mm -hmm. And so I, I can't really comment on particular medications or um, how you would treat something with, with medication. What I can say though is, in my experience, if a person is um, very depressed or very anxious, they can find talking therapy really uncomfortable mm. and really, really difficult. Mm. And in some of those cases, what we found is if they go to see their GP or see a psychiatrist and are put on medication, it helps them to engage in the therapeutic process a little bit better. I don't know if you know the answer to this one, but it was psychology, psychiatrists around before psychology? Because I feel, just from layman terms again, that it was always, you know, give the person, uh, prescribe them a drug to calm them down, but then did talking therapy come in later after that, or has that always been around? I think psychiatry has probably been around for longer. Mm. Traditionally, psychiatrists used to do talking therapy. Oh, okay. So that's where it gets a bit confusing. Mm. So a lot of the great um, people in psych the world of psychology were actually psychiatrists. Okay. And they were um, practicing different forms of talking therapy and researching it and um, seeing what has evidence and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Um, in WA in particular, in Australia in general, psychiatrists generally mostly look at medication. Mm -hmm. In other countries, uh, in America for example, a lot of psychiatrists will do the talking therapy and they'll do the medication, so they do both. So okay. it depends what country you live in and, and mm -hmm. even to, uh, to a degree what state you live in. Okay. Yeah. Have you personally seen an increase in uh, any conditions that could lead to suicide during COVID? Yeah, so I think COVID has really um, increased the, what we call this global level of anxiety. Mm. So everybody's a little bit more on edge, everybody's a little bit more worried and fearful because there's a global pandemic. So um, absolutely, there's, there's a lot more fear uh, around the world. Now in Australia and in Western Australia in particular, we've been virtually untouched by COVID mm. uh, directly, but I do think that a lot of people have relatives and friends around Australia, around the world, who are experiencing a lockdown, self-isolation, mm. quarantine, diagnosis, hospitalizations. So I think as a nation, we are more worried about others. Mm. And obviously we're worried about the unknown, like fear breeds on the unknown. So yeah. we're really, we're more anxious. But at the same time, um, there's been an increase in, in Perth, uh, and I believe across Australia, with people access, accessing mental health support. Okay, that's a good thing. Yeah, so the rates of people seeing psychologists has absolutely increased mm -hmm. uh, over the last, you know, almost 12 months now. Mm. Um, and the government has supported that by increasing the number of sessions a person can access under Medicare, mm. and also uh, allowing telehealth, mm. uh, which is doing video uh, therapy mm. rather than a person having to come into the therapy room. Just going back, I said um, that's a good thing. And what I meant by that was it, 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 it would appear that people are, are actually starting the conversation versus maybe um, not. That's yeah. what I just wanted to clarify that. Absolutely. Um, 
Has suicide increased during COVID? Now, we did predict that there would be an increase in suicide, mm. and this was based on um, data from the global financial crisis. So the world is going through an economic recession at the moment. Mm. When the same thing happened in 2008, we did see an increase in suicide, and we saw um, more of an increase in men, and we saw more of an increase in those countries where there were high rates of unemployment. Mm -hmm. So we thought that we would see an increase in suicide. However, the stats aren't out for the, the um, Australian Bureau of Statistics hasn't released their stats yet for last year, mm. but the New South Wales um, government came up with a system last year called the, I'll get this right, Suicide Monitoring and Data Management System. Mm. So they've drawn on information from the New South Wales Police and the New South Wales Coroner, and they've kept track of the statistics over the year they found a 5% decrease in suicide as compared to the previous year. Now, this is unprecedented. Right. Yeah. I use that word again. We're using it all over the place with COVID. Mm. Um, we haven't seen a decrease in suicide anywhere in Australia for mm. years. Yeah. Obviously, it's early days. We need to see all the states yeah. and we need to understand that. Mm. But when I actually stopped to think about that, it started to make sense in terms of when we look at what the Australian government has put in in terms of job keeper and job seeker with financial assistance, people may be losing their jobs, but they're getting financial support to a degree to be able to pay the bills and yeah. to keep living. So they may not feel like a burden on other people. Um, and so that kind of changes things. Mm. And as you just said, people are having the conversation. So I think the media has actually been a positive influence with looking at mental health, looking out for each other, uh, supporting each other, talking about our mental well-being. Yeah, well, excellent. So with our first discussion we had, uh, the takeaway for me was to, you know, the first, uh, the first step was go and see a GP. If you've got somewhere, if you've got concerns, go and see a GP and then get a refer referral to a psychologist. Yep. Yeah. Well, my takeaway from today's conversation is that from what we're saying is if you start the, st start the conversation, you stop the isolation. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And um, if you're thinking or worried about someone, remember, if they're noticing a difference in how they're thinking, how they're feeling, or are there any physical changes? So the yeah. three, those three key steps. Yeah. So how they're thinking, how they're feeling, or have they had, is there any physical changes? Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's really good. That's a really good takeaway yeah. to look at those three areas and then if it's impacting a lot on mm. their ability just to live their life normally. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's a wrap. Yeah. So yeah. thank you again, Ema. It's Ima. been great. Thank you. Um, so again, thank you for, 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 for listening and make sure you take the time to smile today. Mm -hmm. It's Derek Best from Beacon Fight for Life. Take care.